you have your Bibles, please open to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and I'll meet you there in just a moment. I'm so glad to see all of you in the audience this morning. And we have a lot larger crowd than we had last week, and we're glad that everyone is back from their traveling and holiday time and everything. I hope that you'll keep in mind some great things for the new year for the Ripley Church of Christ. And I want to encourage you this year to sort of branch out a little bit. If you've never been involved, uh, I would encourage you to seek to be involved. A lot of great things are going on and have been going on. I'm so thankful for our youth group who is doing a lot, a lot of things as well. So please, if you can, in 2019, to keep the work of the Ripley Church of Christ in your mind and in your heart. There was an elderly couple and they sort of argued a lot, and they have just reached a point in their marriage where they really didn't get along anymore. And at any rate, you know, they had a big fight, and uh, the husband came to his wife. He said, look, you know, I, do, I don't want to fight with you. I'm tired of fighting with you. He said, I'm so sorry that I said some things I shouldn't have said. I regret it, and I was wrong. But he said, I got to ask you, how in the world do you always stay so calm? She looked at him and she said, well, when I get upset with you, I just go scrub the floor. He didn't understand. He said, well, what do you mean? Why does that keep you calm? She looked at him and she said, because I use your toothbrush. <laughs> you ever heard the saying that revenge is so sweet? Well, the truth is it's not sweet. It's based upon something that has been motivated and it is an anger that has been boiling inside of you. And I want to talk to you about this anger today. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, if you're there, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will repay, says the Lord. I saw a, a post on Facebook or somewhere th this week. It said, my patience has been tested, and yes, I'm negative. <laughs> I kind of like that. You know, we can all relate to that in some form or some fashion. If you have a soul, you struggle with anger. I saw this also this week, and I thought, you know what? I have never preached a sermon about anger. I guess this was maybe Sunday or Monday of last week. It says, choices made in anger cannot be undone. And for some reason, it just stopped me in my tracks, and I thought, that is so true. I said, I've got to preach my first sermon about anger. So I went in my office, and I tried to dig, and I prepared this lesson. And I hope that it will help all of us including your preacher. I think that anger is something that we can allow to, to, for us to save things that we do not mean. It can allow us to probably do things that we wouldn't normally do otherwise. Something I will say that I hope is true about all of us, that it gets better with time. <laughs> As a young man, when I got angry, I was very unpredictable. <laughs> And I look back and I think to myself, you know, that was so stupid. Why, why would you do something like that? So hopefully, Lord willing, as we get older, we get wiser. And I hope that older Christians in here will set the example for the younger ones today. I want to give you a few verses as we begin. The Bible says, as a stone is heavy and sand is weighty, a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. The Bible says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. You know, I think about people in the Bible who allowed their anger to destroy them. And there are probably more, you know, these are the only ones that I could think about. I want to focus on one in particular, but just think about these. Cain murdered his brother. Moses not only murdered an Egyptian, but he lost the opportunity to enter the promised land because of a second time that he got angry. King Saul was so angry at David that he took a javelin and tried to throw it and it barely missed him and stuck in the wall. He almost killed him. Ahab was so angry at Naboth 
because he would not sell him his vineyard, he just killed him and took it. Jonah was so angry that the Ninevites repented when he preached to them. He didn't want them to repent. You remember God told him to go to Nineveh and he went 1,500 miles in the opposite direction and he was swallowed by a fish and finally he said, okay, I'll go preach to the Ninevites. But when he did, he was so angry at God that they repented that God punished him. Then when he was punished, you know what he told God? Just take my life from me. He was so upset. But I want to focus on James and John this morning. These are two men that stand out to me because in the book of Luke chapter 9 and verse 54, you may remember that Jesus was going to go through Samaria and he did. And James and John were with him. And the Bible says that the Samaritans did not receive Jesus. So you know what James and John said? By the way, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, James and John are called the sons of chaos. The King James says, sons of thunder. Why does the Bible call them that? Well, because when the Samaritans didn't receive Jesus, they said, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven just like Elijah did? Do you remember the story of Elijah and the 400 prophets of Baal? When Elijah called down fire from heaven and it devoured the sacrifice that was right in front of them? The sons of thunder said, Lord, just say the word and we'll do it. We'll call down fire upon every single one of these people. <laughs> they allowed their anger to destroy them. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to Ephesians chapter 4, which is our text for this morning. In talking about the subject of what I would call angry birds. <laughs> How many of you have ever played that game, by the way? I kind of like the game, actually. I think they made a cartoon movie about uh, that game and the little kids. You know, they learn lessons about anger by watching the movie Angry Birds. So today, although we're not watching a movie, we can see a, a play depicted in front of us about how we deal with anger as Christians. And I want to tell you, there are some things that happened this week even. And I was surprised at my reaction because even before, I probably would have yelled out a few curse words and maybe even threw a rock on the ground or probably my cell phone or something like that. And I thought, you know what? There is a difference in my life now. I can see changes just because I'm a Christian. I'm gonna give you an example. I didn't intend on this, but I'll give you an example. I had my trailer behind my truck and I went to Little Caesars to pick up some pizza and I forgot my trailer was behind my truck. So when I backed up, I heard this crunch. That's the second time that's happened, by the way. First time I had my four-wheeler on my trailer. I didn't even get out of my truck. Put my car in drive, drove off and drove home, got out at the house and looked at the damage. I was like, I thought about that later. I was shocked. Because I want to tell you, about 10 years ago, I would have got out of that truck yelling and cursing and probably would have kicked another dent in the truck because I was that angry. Friend, I want to tell you today, as a teenager and as a young adult in my 20s, I was the angriest person in the world. And I thought to myself, if you dare cross me, I will teach you that you better not cross me ever again. That was my personality. Friend, I want to tell you, and the people that I hung out with, they were the same way. I realized those kind of people are not people, number one, that are your friends. Number two, you cannot live life as a Christian and be angry. Friends, sometimes I feel like people just look for opportunities to be angry at people. And I've learned as a Christian, you can't live that way. And I hope that's what we learn from the lesson today. Number one, we're going to talk about the discussion. We're going to talk about the danger. We'll talk about the destruction. And then we'll talk about the decision. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, we're going to find these four points for our lesson this morning. Notice the text. Be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now notice this. Neither give place 
to the devil. I wonder why he included that part. Because the devil wants no better opportunity than to deceive you when you're angry. Friend, that's the best time to commit sin in the eyes of the devil. He said, oh, okay, he thinks he's not going to sin. Well, let me get him angry, and then we'll see what happens, what he does. If we're honest, we all struggle from time to time when we're angry. I found this quote. I want to share it with you. A man said, I never go to bed mad at my wife because when we get in an argument, she makes me sleep on the couch. (laughs) That's probably true. The lesson that we learn from this passage is, It's the lesson that you learn from the quote. It's never wise to go to bed with anger in your soul. Now, sometimes you may not can help it, but the idea is you cannot let it smolder. Maybe one night, all right, okay, you went to bed mad, all right. What about the next night? The next week? the next month. You see, this will cause problems in your job. It will cause problems with your brethren. It will cause problems in your marriages. And God says it's never smart to let that anger smolder within you. And that's mainly what we want to talk about today. So number one, let's talk about the discussion. You'll notice in the text that he says, he did not say, be not angry for that's a sin. No, he said, do not be angry and sin. (laughs) You see, anger is not a sin because even Jesus himself was angry. Look at Matthew chapter 21. I want to give you just a few verses here and then I'm going to move on to my second point. It is not a sin to be angry. So when we talk about the discussion here, um, I think that you'll understand what we're talking about as we move on. In Matthew chapter 21, you remember that Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem, uh, what they call on Palm Sunday. A great celebration took place. He was riding on a donkey, and they put palm leaves in front of him. They cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. But he is coming there to die. And the first thing he sees when he comes in Jerusalem are these men that are called priests, who have made a business out of the church. That's what they've done. You see, because here's what happens. A man comes all the way from, say, Italy or Greece as a Jew, and he has to offer a sacrifice, but he can't bring a bull all the way from Italy. So what he does is he brings a bag of money, and he says, I'll purchase a bull when I get there to offer to God. And these priests, we'll call them preachers, because this is what happens on the television today, The televangelists do this. They bring their money to offer sacrifice to God, and they say, I need a bull. And the priest says, all right, that will be $1,400. And the man says, $1,400? In Italy, I can buy one at home for $400. And the preacher looks at him and says, well, then you need to go back to Italy and buy you one. But if you're going to buy one here to offer it to God, we're going to charge you $1,000 more. And Jesus sees this. And he gets so upset, the Bible says in John's account, that he made a whip. Here's what he did with it. Jesus went into the temple of God. He cast out all them that sold doves and bought in the temple and, all the, and he overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Do you think Jesus was angry? <laughs> I've never seen a happy person throw over a table, <laughs> you know? You know if that happens, somebody's really upset. In fact, I think some of them were in that room and they're like, ooh, man, Jesus is mad. He was very angry. Even God gets angry. Let me share these verses with you. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 18. Sorry about the jump there. Therefore the Lord was angry with Israel and he removed them out of his sight and there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Some of those people were killed. God was angry. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 4. 
For they will turn away your son from following me that they may serve other gods and the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will destroy thee suddenly. Anger is not the problem or the sin. It can cause people to sin. There was a man who visited a Buddhist temple on one occasion. But the only way that you could get to the temple was by going up in a basket you know, several hundred feet up a cliff. The tourist was very curious when he got to the top. He, he asked one of those Buddhist monks, he said, I've got to ask you, how often do you change the rope? The monk thought about it. He said, when the rope break, we change the rope. <laughs> it's too late then. You know, so, somebody's already been killed. You know, the same consequences can happen when people get angry. You ever heard somebody say, he snapped? The rope just broke. It's never a pretty sight when that happens. But you know, angry is not a sin, but people can commit sins when they're angry. I'm gonna share with you this poem, and then I'm gonna give you an application and then move on. When harsh feelings smolder, I will wear a chip on my shoulder. Usually anger is never skin deep, but it represents a burden that I have to keep. Anger may not be the problem, just the symptom. Healing problems are usually never simple. When Jesus is my rock and God is my anchor, they help heal the problems that cause my anger. Friend, I believe that to be so true. There's a deeper problem usually when people are angry people. And I hope that God will begin to heal those problems in your life and in mine. And it will help heal the anger issues that we have sometimes when we get angry. Number two, not only do we mention uh, this discussion, but the danger of it. And before I move on, you know, James, he mentioned the passage in James chapter one when he said, the wrath of man is not the righteousness of God. So a man cannot be a Christian and do things in anger and still say that he's a faithful Christian. He just can't do it. Now, I hope today that you realize that you're not going to be perfect. But begin to work on it. One of my main problems today, and I'll make a confession to you today, one of my main problems today, which I'm so thankful that this is an improvement, but I still raise my voice when I get angry. And sometimes it's not necessary. Now, there may come a time, you know, hopefully not, but there may come a time when I revert back. Maybe I get real mad and say a cuss word. Now, that may be few and far between. I hope it is. But I'll be honest with you, friend. I'm not a perfect person. I hope it doesn't happen, but it could. And I would say probably a couple of times a year, it may happen. But so far, I've made a decision in my life to say that's never going to happen again. And I hope that you make that decision too. So today, that's what I'm going to work on this year. I'm going to work on not raising my voice when I get angry. Well, today, you've got to make a decision. What's going to be your choice for 2019? There are dangers that happen, and I want to share with you some of these dangers. Let's look here in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to give you three of these. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. There was a lady. She said, you know, my Uncle Teddy, he was such an angry person that on his tombstone, it said, what are you looking at? <laughs> I had to include that. You know, if we, if we fly off in a rage, there's always a bad landing. Every single time. You think about those characters in the Bible we mentioned a moment ago. Every single time they flew off the handle, they had a bad landing. Anger is not a sin, but there is a danger in the anger. I don't want to talk to you about that in this point now. Look here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. He said, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. But he takes it a step further. 
He said, and the whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, you are worthless. In this language, raka. You are a worthless one. You'll be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. You know what he's teaching here? We've got to be careful how we view other people. Is that easy? It's not easy. Something that I'm learning more and more, and I hope this continues, and I hope I continue to grow in this. Love is the most important quality of a Christian that he can have. There are some people right now I can think of in my mind And I can think about some of the struggles that they have. One preacher in particular, I think in my mind right now, I I know of a struggle that he has right now, but he is one of the most loving and kind people that I have ever met in my life. And I think to myself, he can overcome anything. I know he can overcome those struggles because his quality and his character that he he, he wakes up with every day and he goes to bed with every night. He is a man who loves God first and he loves his neighbor as himself. And I think to myself, I want to do that. I want to be like that preacher. You know, Jesus was like that too. The difference in Jesus is he didn't have any other struggles. But I hope today that you and I will make a decision and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what they're guilty of. It doesn't matter how bad they get on my nerves or they get on your nerves. Jesus says, I cannot look at that brother and think that he is worthless because he's not. God says the danger in the anger is that it can cause me to be in danger of hellfire. There was a young teenage boy and he had a problem with his temper And his daddy got so sick of what he was doing. He said, I've got to teach him a lesson somehow. I don't know what to do. I've spanked him. I've grounded him. I've taken away his car. He tried everything. He had to find some way to make it sink in his own mind. So he took his teenage boy outside. He put a post in the ground. And he said, every time you you get angry and you fly off the handle, I want you to come here and I want you to put a nail in this post. And the first month, I mean, he... He had probably 25 or 30 nails in there already, so that's like one a day. But he began to realize, I'm out of control. The nails got less and less throughout the next three or four months. After the year was up, he didn't even have a nail in the, the, a new nail in the post. For a whole month, he, he went, he didn't have a new nail. So his daddy took him outside and he said, I want you to remove every single nail that's in that post. That was a, there was a bag full. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He thought, man, that's who I was. His daddy asked him, he said, son, what's wrong with that post? And the boy hung his head. He knew. He said, dad, those scars are still there. His daddy told him, that's what I've been trying to teach you all along. The scars will always be there. You cannot take back the things that you have already said. That young man lived the rest of his life with that lesson in his mind. The reason is because he taught it to himself. Yes, his daddy showed him, but that was a lesson he realized on his own, the dangers of of his anger. Let me give you another one. I'm going to give you two more and then I'm going to move on. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, he said, now the works of the flesh are these. Now notice this. He equates anger and wrath with fornication, uh, with uh, emulations, hatred, witchcraft. He, He mentions these. He said, they're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations. Notice, thumos. You know what a thermometer is? It gauges the temperature. That's the word for wrath. The word thumos. 
strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. He equates wrath with murder <laughs> because every murder that's ever been caused, what's it been caused by? It's been caused by wrath. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now notice this. Of which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Friend, what's the danger in this? I can lose my soul over being angry. You could lose your soul over being angry. So we talk about not only the discussion, but the danger. And I want to give you this verse, and then I'm going to move on to my third point. He says, a wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. He that is soon angry deals foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. You know, I have seen people in the church, and even in my own life, I think back at times that I have ruined perfect opportunities because of anger. You know what the Bible says about an elder in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7? That he cannot be soon angry. And a man that's desiring a position like an elder, he can ruin it when he displays his soon anger ability. For in a perfect job, he's waiting for you in the corporate world. But a CEO sees the way that you have acted and 10 years down the road, he knows exactly who he is not gonna choose for that job. Because everybody saw how your anger was displayed on that occasion. I can think back even in my own life of opportunities that I perfectly had right before me. And I look back and I think, I know why I did not get chosen for that particular work because of the mistakes that I had made when I was angry. Number three, let's talk about the destruction then. So we talk about how these things can affect us. You know, we think about uh, superheroes like Wolverine. Was he a great superhero? I love Wolverine. I think he is really cool. But I learned a lesson from him. He had a problem, and his problem with his anger you think about the Hulk, and every time you mention Hulk, what do you think of? Hulk smash, right? And the reason is because when he gets upset, you better watch out because he's fixing to smash something. These men allowed these characteristics to destroy them. That's why the Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I want to share with you this story that I read this week. And if you're at Pro, in the book of Proverbs, I want to invite you to chapter 12 just quickly before I move on to my last point. There was a man who noticed his wife with another man. He even saw his wife kiss him on the cheek. He was so furious. He just couldn't even say anything. You know, she came home that night. He, he, couldn't, even, he couldn't even look at her. So time went on. Even a couple of days went by. And finally, he came home one afternoon and she was in the back bedroom. He just couldn't take it anymore. She came in the kitchen with, with a letter and he yelled at her. And he said, I can't even believe you're still here. She didn't understand. He had a pitcher in his hand and he, he was so angry that he threw it on the ground. Glass was everywhere. She tried to come near him to comfort him, and he pushed her down. He didn't realize it at that moment, but that glass stuck in her back, and he saw blood all over the floor, and she bled to death right in front of him. He couldn't believe what he had just done. He thought to himself, he said, I can't believe this. How did this happen? She had that letter in her hand and he opened it and here's what it said. Honey, I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful for you. And I wanted to surprise you and tell you that I'm pregnant. Also, I wanted to tell you that I've been reunited with my long lost brother and I met with him three times this week. He's also an obstetrician and he said that he will cover all of my prenatal care for free I invited him for dinner tonight and she's dead 
Friend, I know that's an extreme. I know probably that something like that probably would never happen in your house. But it makes a perfect point to show that no matter who you are or where you're from, there are things that happen unexpectedly when people get angry. And God says, you better be careful. Someone may not die, but something bad can happen. Notice these passages. Proverbs 12, 16, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man, he covers shame. The Bible says that he who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In Ephesians chapter 4, which is right after your text this morning, he said, let all bitterness and, and anger and wrath and clamor and evil speaking be put away from among you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sakes hath forgiven you. Now I wanna share with you what's happening here before I move on to my last point because it's interesting how he did this in the original language. It goes a step up each time. You see, bitterness is something that starts way from within, you know? You think, oh, I just, mm, I'm not in that. But then it takes a step further. It, it becomes more like, all right, we're fixing to do something now. But then it's anger. It's more visible. It's all over your face. That's the idea. That's the word for thumos. It's all over your face now. People out, outwardly know what you're feeling. And then the word for clamor. That means an outcry. It's funny how he did that in the original language. He, he did a step up each time, which causes malice, he said. Number four, and finally, I hope you'll challenge yourself this year. I've challenged myself, and that's what I try to do, I hope, for each lesson. I want to challenge myself. I want you to challenge yourself. That's my job, and that's your job. We take the Bible, the lessons that we learn, and we say, all right, how am I going to put this into practice? So number four, let's talk about the decision. I want to give you two passages here. Let's go to the book of Proverbs chapter 15. There was a husband who decided he was going to make up with his wife, so he baked her a cake, you know. He, he thought, I'm going to do something special, something she knows I put time into. So she comes home from work, and he gives her a kiss, you know, and he said, I've been thinking about you today. And he said, you know what? I did something special. I want you to know I love you. So he went in there and he cut a piece of cake and he brought it. He was so happy. She sat down. She tasted it. She said, man, that's, that's really good. She said, I love you. He looked at her and smiled. He said, that's the cake talking, isn't it? She said, no, that's me talking to the cake. <laughs> you know, that's how anger is turned away. Even the Bible teaches that. You know, the Bible says, he that is slow to anger is better than he that is mighty, and he that uh, ruleth his spirit better than he that takes a city. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. And then finally... The discretion of a man defers his anger. He tries to sweep it under the rug. He's like, look, how can we solve this? And it is a glory to pass over a transgression. Friend, I want to ask you a serious question when you think about the subject of being angry. As you sit there today and you think about your relationship with God, is God angry with you? Are you angry with God? Is there something that's causing you to feel animosity toward God? Is there something that's causing God to feel animosity towards you? God is wanting to reconcile that anger today, whether it's from him or from you. And I hope that you make a decision. You say, you know what? I've been angry with God long enough. And I don't want God to be angry with me anymore that you'll make a decision right now to be at peace with God. You know, the Bible calls that a peace that passes all understanding. If you're willing to obey the gospel right now, you can squash all animosity that God could have towards you.
Will you come? I'm gonna give you one verse today. I, I could give you every verse on the screen, but I wanna just make it clear to you. I want you to think about one passage today because in Acts chapter two, when the church began, the Bible says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know what they were wondering? How can we get rid of the anger that God has because of us killing his son? What do we need to do, they said. And Peter said unto them in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Friend, I beg of you to think about that today. Will you obey the gospel today? Because no matter what, every person in this room that's accountable for their actions is guilty of killing God's son. Will you come today, right now, and obey the gospel as we stand and sing?